Okay, right, so I'm going to talk about the creation of man himself. So, some of these messages were purported to be given by Jesus Christ. And my mother really became quite sort of taken up with all this. However, I was amazed to see that Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice of Battenberg, also was approached in a similar way. She was an amazing woman. She had, she spoke five languages. She was married to Prince Andrew of Greece. She was deaf from birth. And I think she had four girls before she had Prince Philip. And she was suddenly approached and her family put her in a mental home. And then um, the great um, Freud irradiated her womb and her ovaries, saying that he thought she was suffering from sexual frustration. Terrible man. Anyway, she continued to do marvelous work and um, she set up a marvelous soup kitchen in, in Athens, feeding the poor. She, protected Jewish people who were, you know, trying to escape from the Nazis. She did so many things. And she started up this religious nursing thing. So she, so my, my mother wasn't the only person who thought she was having a religion. So this is one of the early um, dictations. And there, there's so much in them. I, th I was thought I would just read it to people, but I feel that I can't. I feel that I must read it. So I'm afraid you'll have to look at me in my glasses and the top of my head. So this is, um, this is the creation of man himself. How, children ask, are we born? Where do we come from? Gooseberry bushes and other wild ideas told to fretful children should now all completely dis disappear just like the promise of paradise after death, or gone to Jesus, which unfortunately bears no possible sort of link with reality whatsoever. The Christian Bible is regarded as perhaps one of the most important messages ever given to the world, as is the Quran and other Hindu and Buddhist scriptures, which purport to speak of man rising up after death to marvellous places of pleasure and paradise, completely impossible in physical life. In another chapter, we will deal at length with the Christian religion and Jesus himself, well known to those of us who dictate this book. In the beginning, a man, for a man he was and is, dressed in elegant, seemingly blue, 17th century costume, appeared to the writer. And this has a very important meaning. It means that this is not in any way a religious message, but simply knowledge, a knowledge which must clear away forever the foolish superstitions of the 17th century. Everything which is now in the world is based upon the knowledge and beliefs of the 17th century, which have survived until the present day, and are illogical and completely false. In the beginning was God, it says in the Bible, and to this day people have an impossible vision or idea of some impossibly large being clad in shining armour to whom all prayers can be directed and hopefully answered, comforting perhaps, but untrue and false. No one, absolutely no one, can possibly come to understand what or how this fantastic universe and the people within it were conceived of in the first place, or whether there are other universes even more fantastic in size and concept to which we shall all go when we have reached the ultimate of our development. And this, perhaps, must be the nearest thing to ultimate paradise. If there is such a thing that can possibly emerge... No, I've said that wrongly. And this, perhaps, can be the nearest thing to ultimate paradise if there is such a thing that can possibly be imagined. No one being could possibly run or rule or create this vast universe, or even this one small planet, no one. In the beginning, then, what is there? A lonely God busily churning out his little people because he was lonely and needed someone to watch over. This is the basic idea held by many people, and particularly of most religious people. In the beginning, it's a fantastic mass of fire, of power, which is the ultimate, in the ultimate produces rocks and a whole revolving automated scheme of things, so marvellous and so complicated that it defies description. And everything, absolutely everything, works more or less on the same principle, even human beings themselves, who take many millions of years to create. Firstly, then, one has a planet ready for habitation. 
the fire and earthquakes have died down. The sun warms it and gentle breezes blow over its waters. It is now ready and already beginning to teem with this mysterious thing, life. All life begins with water and nothing is created on this structure without this precious fluid, which is made up of those other two basic parts of the creation of oxygen and hydrogen. All school children know H2O, oxygen, in one part and hydrogen in two parts, the basis of creation. All school children listen with bored lassitude to descriptions of the first type of little creature, the amoeba, and this is the very beginning of life. This little creature, which in itself is amazing, it can divide and subdivide and grow as it rolls around in fluids that surround it and gobbles up algae, which is the beginning of plant life, green slime. Until water and green algae of all sorts and types can develop, then no life can survive on any planet. And you notice um, in swimming pools, if they're not very well looked after, green slime forms along and in all water you get um, spirandrara, sort of green hair like weed and that cleans the water. There are, nothing is done, nothing is, is done, it, it, wait a minute, it's because if nothing is done it takes millions upon millions of years for a planet to slowly evolve. Simple fish type creatures which as time goes on become fish slimy worms, eels, lizards and frogs. It is lizards and frogs that slowly climb out of the slime and in millions upon millions of years slowly evolve into other creatures. There are also various types of insect that develop in all manner of miraculous ways, but in every case they must begin with water, like the dragonfly that spends the first part of its life in water before climbing up a plant stem and shedding its outer shell. It becomes the beautiful creature with wings that flies about in sunlight. In the beginning it was said to the writer by our 17th century representatives that everything is like a network in which, in which work must go on without cessation, and this is true. Part of that work is to traverse the universe and find other planets that are becoming ready for habitation when true hard work must begin. Firstly, it must be remembered that this universe and everything within it exists on two structures at once the physical creative living structure and the non-living, non-creative structure. After death, all intelligent humanity, if it does not immediately live again, exists on the stru structure that we live on, the after-death non-living structure, which looks much the same, does not age in the same way, does not eat, does not therefore excrete, and thereafter does not either recreate itself or give birth. Only upon the living physical planes does mating, birth and the whole creation of life take place. Every planet is two planets, whether it is inhabited or uninhabited or uninhabitable. And the other structure is where the rest planes or life after death place exist all around the living in such a way as to be quite invisible to the living. But if we so desire it, not invisible to us. We, the non-living, do not watch the living unless it is our wish or our task to do so, when we may, if we so desire, slip into the living world whenever we wish and do those tasks that must be done to keep the living going and promote life in emerging planets. What the intelligent may ask happens when in the very beginning, when there are simply no living persons anywhere to visit an emergent planet, what then? It simply takes millions and millions of years longer. In the very beginning, there simply are only basic instincts, insects and a few very small animals. Trees grow and plants grow, as without basic insects, the trees and flowers and the plants cannot grow either. When this stage has been reached, hopefully someone on our structure hears of this emergent planet and thereafter goes to its rescue. There are, in this universe, all too few planets that are habitable. And possibly millions that have not yet been found. A planet such as yours is very precious, very precious indeed. Given greater knowledge and help, it could be a marvellous place for everyone to live in. This is our hope for your planet. All creatures slowly grow from one life to the next, but only certain ones ever become humanity. 
These are the stinging insects of all types and kinds who must stalk their prey and find ways to lay in wait, killing them instantly, and, this way, and in this way develop a basic intellect. Perhaps this is the saddest thing about creation, as far as man is concerned. It is based entirely upon violence, without which mankind, as an intelligent, thinking, calculated being, would not exist at all. This is the truth about humanity. All little basic creatures, fish, insects, birds, all exist like man upon two structures at once. That is to say that in all creation of life, two bodies, one inside the other, are formed, which is not the entity or the soul. This is something indestructible, whereas the two bodies based upon electricity, like everything else that is living, is destructible. However, not all creatures will progress on to become human. Look at the birds in the sky swooping around in groups. Hardly ever do birds progress to humanity. They are the living embodiments of other unseen creatures that carry messages in the way of a carrier pigeon. Each one has a special task and is automated in a particular way to give warnings of imminent disaster in the living world, both privately to members of family clans and on a grander scale. There are, throughout the universe, all manner of creatures similar to birds, some on a microscopic scale, that continue to report back to their base in a magical way. Every single person, animal, and even insect that is intelligent and is, in cre cre is created in the physical sense is equipped with these microscopic creatures within it. These little creatures become part of the control system in the bodies of more advanced creatures and become messengers that help in the healing of illness, the maintaining of the host's body's metabolism, or warnings of danger from the outside world. And they will be released to report back to the appropriate system when the host body either dies or gives birth, initiating the complicated process that must take place. Through all creation you have a tremendous variety of different sorts of creatures and all creatures must devour each other and live through the killing, catching and eating of their prey. Anyone who tries to think it out for themselves must see that there could be no other way. In a world which decays constantly and then grows new life all the time, nature does not brook anything that is old or worn out, it simply destroys it and creates a new beautiful one. Violence, death and destruction, the very act of survival, is the way that the intellect is formed in the killing, stinging insect and is the very basis of mankind himself. Hence the violence in mankind himself that rises up continually to threaten the peace and stability of the world. All simple creatures live and eat each other in such a way that the creature, when it dies, hardly knows what has happened to it and is born again in yet another egg cell of some sort to take its place in the scheme and order of things. All creatures must not only die when their span is over, but their bodies must be so created that they are disposed of cleanly and forever, leaving no mess. This is the only way that the physical world can remain an unpol as unpolluted as possible, at least in the beginning, before mankind rises up to pollute it in all manner of different ways. Eventually you get to the small four-footed creature which in many millions of years has mutated. One of the things they're not saying here is that each creature, when it gets to the end of a certain stage, its entity is, um, is then combined with two of another, so male and female, of another entity similar to go forward to being a higher creature. So. Eventually you get to a small four-footed creature which in many millions of years has mutated from some simple insect or frog. The frog is most often the beginning of a long chain of creatures having four legs and two eyes and a mouth placed vaguely in the same sequence as humanity. Only the best survive to go forward to a better life. Only the most intelligent of millions ever become yet another slightly more intelligent creature until you get the ape or monkey in all its different forms and it is the ape or monkey who is the very beginning of man himself. The knowledge we are giving is simple and basic. There is simply no point in trying to explain to ordinary people the complicated mechanics of creation, some of which are so mysterious as to be unknown and unfathomable in any case. 
If a planet is not found, then it cannot rotate beyond a certain point. The most important and boring work that must be done is the searching for emergent planets for future colonisation. It can take several hundreds of years travelling about the heavens by living people on our structure to find a living planet ready for the important work that must go on century after century to bring any planet to life. In fact, a friend of my father's, who was a naval um, pilot, died suddenly at 50 to everybody's shock and amazement. He had um, some kind of hereditary heart condition. He gave several messages to my mother and he said that was one of the jobs that he did, which was to um, go around the universe looking for habitable planets. Often people um, who are doing this job have to be put into a semi-coma type state so that they can they can continue. They just sleep until the planet gets, until they, um, they have sort of like spaceships on the other side as well that take them to these planets. And then they, um, when they find a planet, then they tell other people so that a high, higher beings can go and help the planet to move forward because they're always looking for places where humanity can be started. And um, he told my mother about one place which looked as though it had been habitable and there was no one around. So the people of that planet had just disappeared. Where they'd gone, nobody knew. Either they'd been wiped out by another planet or they had um, died of some war. No one can know. So they're hoping that that will not happen to us. So if with Miles' help I can get this message out to people, either we will accept it or we won't. Um, but it gives you a very different attitude to life. Anyway, I'll continue. So everything works on a computerised basis and all entities or souls must pass through an extremely complicated computer in such a way that their future life or lives are decided. There are here, just as there are in the living physical world, laboratories, hospitals and other places where work must go on continually. Many scientists and doctors whose lives end do not end up on the rest planes, but have further work to do on this structure here. There is always an enormous amount of work that must be done constantly to keep a living planet functioning at all, never mind perfectly, which few living planets do. These hospitals, libraries and vast complicated laboratories must be set up and someone with great knowledge must run them. These people must be those on our structure who may live from any period of up to two or three thousand years and to do this they must be given special help in the form of continual boosts of life force which is the same for those of us who live here on the structure on, or non-physical life. The whole basis of life is reincarnation. Without that, no life could be possible. The whole basis of life for humanity is constantly change. Humanity and even animals quickly become bored if there is not constant stimulus, which makes the ancient concept of heaven absolutely absurd. No one could possibly sit around in ultimate light strumming a musical instrument indefinitely or wandering around aimlessly and remain happy. It is simply not a feasible proposition at all. Intelligent humanity needs to work and the more advanced he becomes the more complicated the work he is able to perform. Tissue which creates life is now being frozen and implanted into host mothers with some success and people take this fact for granted. This is the basic way, in the very beginning, intelligent people must be brought to life to help to create a living planet. It is possible to take tissue from a living person, sperm from a man, or very many, or several ovum from a woman who will be required to live again, either in his or her home planet, or transferred to other possibly millions of miles away, or on the other side of the universe. It's interesting, though, that I read in um, that I read in um, one of um, Lob Sang Rampa's books that they felt that children that were born through IVF and even in inseminated cows, the offspring were not as healthy because the whole thing about creating 
a child with another person or even in animals um, any of their progeny it must go with some sort of sexual attraction it must have this spiritual thing of making love anyway i'll go on to that in another in another um another chapter in the very beginning simple ape man must be created and this means sperm from black brown even white or oriental people from some other part of the universe where the humanity is exactly the same as yours all people must begin in one or other of the colored races Races whose sole function in life is to tend their animals and roam over the wide parts of the earth. All mankind of whatever race exists in the clan system, or should, and becomes extremely unhappy, left alone. Humanity belongs in families, and this is the most important piece of knowledge that human beings of all sorts must come to understand and remember. Once the family clan system breaks down, then humanity turns to all sorts of dreadful self-destructive pursuits and becomes dreadfully unhappy, and that is happening to us now. Simple tribes of people at the very beginning for all humanity, all people must pass through one progression of animal species or many. There are lynx type of people or cat people. There are main, these are mainly to be found in the Chinese or Oriental races. How easy it is to see that their features do often resemble a cat type face. There are also monkeys of some one sort or another who also have this slanted eye type of feature, very agile and belong to the female group of people. It's interesting that um, very often, um, you know, a lot of Indian people and Afghan people, they are much more supple than we in the West are. And um, I noticed the last time I saw Cirque du Soleil, an awful lot of the tremendous feats were being um, performed by Chinese people. Um, this is my comment. I believe that the Chinese and other Oriental races have a particular reverence for the cat. When we lived in Singapore, all the cats had a crooked tail. Apparently there was a superstition which was held that the cat was a very special type of creature. So to make it less perfect, so that it would not take a higher place in heaven than man, all kittens had their tails broken at birth. Perhaps somewhere in their ancient history, their ancestors had been told that they had passed through the cat species to become human being. And over the time, this superstition arose and became a misunderstanding of the real truth. It's interesting that one of the things that, um, one of the progressions that can happen is the little mouse that really doesn't appear to have much character at all will, when it gets to the end of its mouse lifetimes and has a very short gestation period, it will um, have a male and a female combined together to become a rat, which is a much cleverer type of creature. And they will go on to be the domestic cat very often. Look at the back leg. And um, so all cats, which then prey on mice and rats, have actually come up through that way. So that's one of the progressions. Um, anyway, to, to continue with the dictation, there are those who have passed through the dog species, who then pass on to be the lion, and eventually evolve into the dog type of monkey. And you can see that um, the baboon box. An example, of, yeah, I've said, it, an example would be the baboon. There are horse people, and always, even when they have reached the ultimate of intelligence, they will all feel always feel a great affinity with the horse, and the horse with them. And very often, horse people, very rarely do horse people turn to homosexuality. There are within the human races of this planet, and all others, all different types of people, and these relate to the animals from which they have sprung many millions of years before. So, the way it should be is that we all start off as amoeba, and then each race of people has its collection of animals which they pass through. They are a combination of all the animals that um, live on their planet. So, you know, you think the, the Indians are very exotic in the way they are. And you look at the birds and the animals that the Indians have, and they will come from that. Unfortunately, with India, it has been um, not only subjected to a lot of wars and problems and one thing and another, 
which can be found in the Vedas and different um, Indian stories. But also the other thing is that so many people have gone there for trade. So you've had the Greeks, you've had the Romans, you've had the Arabs, you've had the British, you've had the French, you've had the Americans. And the problem with all these different races turning up in a country is they all leave a deposit. And it will be seen later on in a dictation about some experiments you can do with the frog. We should keep to our own races because nobody likes to be mixed race. You don't know where you belong. Not only that, your body doesn't work properly. I believe that um, probably in the late 1700s, one of my relations married a black person. I'm sure they were lovely, but we're not in a matching set. So consequently, I have suffered with a condition called fibroids, which are the biggest killers of black women. And I had a very nice Sierra Leone patient. And um, no, she, I know she was Ugandan. Anyway, she was working as a, as a carer, and she'd had a, some kind of car accident, and she was there having some treatment. And I was asked getting a history from her, and I said, um, why did you have your hysterectomy? And she said, oh, I had fibroids. I said, oh, well, I had those runny things as well. And she said, um, I said, my gynecologist said they're the biggest killers of black women. She said, oh, yeah. She said, if you can't afford the operation in my country, you die. So there you go. Anyway, um, there are within the human races of this planet and all others, all different types of people. And these relate to the animals for which they have sprung many millions of years before. In the very ultimate, there must be the most intelligent of white men set to rule, as they have lived the most lives, and hopefully when complete development is reached, to keep the peace between all nations and try to create a beautiful world for all races. That's the way it should be. We should be going over, uh, around the world and we should be helping all our different races. However, it doesn't seem to be the case at the moment, does it? All too rarely, for a very large variety of reasons, this is never achieved, and humanity destroys itself, and we are on the verge of it now. All life is based on violence, and all too often mankind, in his ignorance, turns to war to subdue a troublesome neighbour, not only to steal his wealth and promote his own, not only because unfortunately man kind all too often having been created through violence enjoys it and seems to need to alleviate the boredom but because with a rising population economies of countries become so complicated that no one knows what to do to stop absolute chaos only certain people of certain races ever become intelligent enough to rule and they are all too few and very precious and might and much sought after throughout the universe all people of all races must live many humble and simple lives doing menial, simple tasks before they have acquired the basis for something better and more advanced. Not everyone can do that. Many never progress very far and are happiest tending either farm animals or growing simple crops within the bosom of their intimate families. This is the happiest type of life for ordinary people who make up the basis of all races and there is no shame in that. Some sorts of races should never be expected to work very much. Simple village life is all that they are suited to, tending livestock or fishing if they live near the sea. They live and die, bring up their children in a communal way and are most often reincarnated back into their family clans where they can be happy for hundreds of years unless, of course, they are chosen to move on, change colour and start on an entirely new, slow light climb of, of growth in intellect. The tragedy of mankind in this planet is that no message of any importance whatsoever has been given to it. The taking of slaves, which has brought about by man's wickedness and greed has gone on for thousands of years long before Christ came and gave his message or for that many matter any of the major prophets of this world simple people who ought to have been left alone were too ignorant and unwary to realise that without some sort of protection they were simply vulnerable and would be seized whole families, wives, husbands and children, everyone Throughout the Mediterranean areas of the world, people have been seized and enslaved. 
also black men in the coastal regions of Africa, and all beaten unmercifully and taken away to strange land to work until they dropped for a cruel master who did not care that they had lost the only thing that humanity exists for, his family. This has been one of the many ways that races have become mixed up, in some places so hopelessly that the original people who must have lived there long ago have disappeared altogether. I mean, at the moment, we only concentrate on um, importation of black slaves into this world. But there is um, a very interesting book that I read some time ago called White Gold. And that deals with, um, at the same time that all these poor black people were brought, being brought into the West, the number of um, white people who were taken by Barbary pirates, whole villages on the coast of England, France, everywhere, taken and slaved all through, um, all through the, along the Silk Road or anywhere, and never heard of again. Absolutely terrible for people. Race in all its various types and colors does not exist simply as some haphazard scheme of nature. Every race is precious. Each individual has things he or she must learn in each lifetime and is equipped to be happiest in the environment they should live in. And this is all part of the basic plan of humanity. Everyone must pass through some sort of colored race before he becomes, in the end, a white man. If in ignorance all the races become hopelessly mixed, terrible sickness in the population will start to arise. People who become very overweight and often ugly with bodies beset with illness of different sorts, not only physical but also mental, and we're starting to have a lot of mental health problems now, to the extent that in the end they must be destroyed and the planet is returned to its fallow state in the hope that in time a new race can be created upon it, or else that they must be kept in store until such time as another home in another part of the galaxy can be found for them but sadly often in planets far less civilized than this one. Humanity does not realize how vital it is to strive for the health of its planet and its own happiness within it. That's the end of that one. So.